all over the world, upcoming space agencies are bringing new innovations to further the boundaries of space exploration. At the 70th International Astronautical Congress in Washington, D.C., thousands of those space actors have come together to provide everyone with the latest in space information. IAC-TV starts right now. Hello and welcome to day two of IAC TV. I'm Sonia Gavankar, ready to bring you everything you need to know from this year's World Congress. Today we'll be with Jeff Bezos, where he will be receiving the Excellence in Industry Award. Hear from the CEO of Virgin Galactic about advancing the space economy and take an in-depth look at what organizations and agencies around the world are doing to push the boundaries of space exploration. First though, let's head to our studio where we get to talk a bit about the industry. I'm here with Bruce Chesley of the Boeing Company. Thank you so much for being here. What excites you about the future of space exploration? I can't think of a more exciting time to be involved in uh, human exploration. Uh, you know, there's so much activity going on uh, around returning humans uh, to space from U.S. soil. Um, you know, our our Starliner vehicle uh, that we're that we have in development now, and which will carry um, commercial astronauts. Uh, to space and you know that's a really exciting thing we're bringing astronauts uh, to low earth orbit on a commercial service and so a real big shift in the way we think about exploration and and then the exciting announcements about the return uh, to the moon and you know the the whole exciting future of human exploration and all of the industry innovation that that sparks you know there all the startups the ecosystem of startups is really exciting as well well you alluded a little bit of that 50th anniversary of returning to the moon mm -hmm. what, tell us a little bit more deeply about what you're excited for in that yeah, well, you know, just on a personal level, that was such an inspiration for me as a small boy. That's what sparked my interest in aerospace and, you know, ultimately led to my career in the profession. So, you know, my hope is that that will spark a whole new generation of innovators and, uh, you know, space innovation as well as, uh, you know, the discoveries and the, uh, the extension of life on a, on a long-term basis outside of, uh, you know, onto another celestial body, I think is really, really exciting. You know, going not just uh, on a camping trip, but really going and, and establishing a permanent presence is a, is a whole different focus for, for that. So there's so many uh, really cool attributes about that. What is your hope for agencies and partners to come out of this conference and come out of these meetings? My hope is that there's a, you know, it's such a unique conference in terms of global participation and global collaboration. And so, you know, continuing to build those bridges of collaboration uh, between agencies and industry, you know, I, I feel like the visions that uh, come out of the space agencies and universities really come to life in industry. And so, so my hope is that we'll get some really exciting visions to go pursue as an industry. So keep that excitement burning and keep going forward and keep inspiring others to to bring them along. Exactly. Excellent. Thank you so much, Bruce, for joining us. Sure. My pleasure. I'm now joined by Enrique Flamini. Welcome. Tell me about the recent findings of liquid water on Mars. Yeah, this is a finding that took to my team, to all the team, quite a lot of time because it's like, you know, the holy grail of any Martian guy, find the water. Water means a lot of stuff means uh, possibly also life. And so this was the really intriguing part. When I speak, when I say water and meaning liquid water, because the, that on Mars, water as ice was present, was known since a quite a long time. The discovery was that we found the lake is buried under something 1,400 meters in the depth of Mars, and is uh, more or less of the size of 20 kilometers yeah. across. We don't know exactly which is the depth because it's impossible to know with the present instrumentation. What makes this find so intriguing right now? It's intriguing because it's the first time ever that liquid Mars has been found permanently on, on Mars. Some kind of, you know, passing by liquid water was, has been observed or the sign of it has been observed. 
but never a permanent body. And uh, this also has an implication of history on Mars, of course, and on the possibility that this water is uh, a pristine water that belongs to the time when Mars was still having ocean lakes on surface. So it could, in principle, maintain, as in the Antarctica case, some organisms that were present on Mars in, uh, in the beginning of his history. Tell me about the technology that was used for this discovery and the nature of the water that was discovered. The technology is a, a radar, but a very special kind of radar, very low frequency radar, was an idea of a professor at University of Rome, uh, Professor Picardi, but uh, uh, that was based on some previous experiences uh, done uh, even in Antarctica as well, because this was the first test bed, real test bed on the Earth, but evolved and specialized to work on Mars. And uh, also was a cooperation with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena and the University of Iowa. So, well, is uh, MARSIS, that is the name of the instrument, is uh, an instrument thought and designed in Italy, but with the cooperation, international cooperation. And this is capable to go to a depth up to 4,500 meters. So even more and more in the depth of Mars. And we did it, by the way. You're going to be giving a talk here. Tell us what people can look forward to in your presentation. Well, what at the end I hope to communicate properly is that it's not easy, that uh, a, a good instrument is needed and the precise knowledge of how the instrument actually works when you are on another planet and also that Mars is uh, still a planet where water can exist and uh, in my view I'm an old Martian I was working also with the Viking missions um, is uh, the best place in our solar system where to have a long permanent human base. Enrico, thank you so much for joining us, telling us the exciting things that are happening in this discovery, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. As usual, the IAC is filled with all kinds of scientific sessions, with big ideas and the latest in space exploration. Let's take a closer look at a few of those sessions. Space economy is very vibrant and very exciting right now in the current days as we are dealing with it. Whether it's uh, private equity investment uh, or uh, government investments, commercial investments, uh, it's very different time that we have ever been through the last 50 years or so. So uh, current estimates are incredible because we are looking at two to three trillion dollar space economy size in the next 20 years. And that is very significant. That's why uh, this affects humanity in a, such a significant way, both economically, security, and, and uh, multiple dimensions. Sustainability of space is, is very critical. Right now, given all the activities in space uh, and all the you know, thousands and thousands of new satellites being launched and uh, spectrum interference, thousands of debris, individual pieces floating in space. So there's so much reliance. That makes uh, sustain sustainability of space very, very critical for the long term. That's why the policy discussions are going to be very important so that uh, globally we could have uh, a common approach to solving this problem because reliance on space has gone up orders of magnitude than it's ever been in, in the past several decades and it's gonna keep getting more and improving and getting better. To build a positive human space future, we think that it requires all the parts of our society. A lot of times when we think about humans going to space, we think about a landscape where it's, where it's space agencies and hero astronauts, and then at the other end there are visionary sci-fi writers, and in between there's nothing. But we need all the people to populate that. We need the artists and the policymakers and the sociologists and the psychologists and philosophers and all the other kinds of scientists. We need everybody on deck to make this happen. And we also need to bring together that, that triangle of government, private sector, and university. I think we just need to pull together to make this positive human space future. 
We think that the ways that the positive human space future happens is, is largely to, through two routes. One is um, the research and the development of the program so that we can go to space and we can become an interplanetary species. And, and, and that's especially where we need these other disciplines. So we, we need the engineers to show us how, but we need all the other aspects of human endeavor to show us what it's going to feel like and how it's going to work for us as humans. It's an, a human endeavor. And the other part is the education and workforce development. We've got to get everyone in the world ready to participate in this and to see this as a way that we can be bolder and better in our own lives here on Earth. It's really for inspiration. It's for who we are as humans. About two and a half years ago, ASU President Michael Crow and I started something called Interplanetary Initiative. And we think that we are especially placed at ASU to bring together all disciplines. It's something we do well. We go across the boundaries. We judge less of each other. We are willing to ask the naive questions of each other that get us places really together as a team. And that's what space exploration takes. It takes all the different parts. And so this initiative at ASU, we have prototyped and now practiced for two years a new way to bring together research teams for faster results. Uh, and so instead of having a research team organized around a hero leader, which is normally the academic way, we organize our research teams around big questions. And that way everyone at the table, whether they're from a, a private partner or from a government agency or whether they're students or faculty or staff or from the, uh, from the uh, community around us, they've all got the right seat at the table to help answer that question. So we have this new way of bringing together teams and we have a new way of educating for the future as well. Space agencies all around the world are working together in order to advance science. Let's take a closer look at some of the agencies that are really pushing the boundaries and getting all of us more excited about space exploration. Space is a very interesting sector. It's a sector where you have the best form of diplomacy. Countries work together regardless of any short-term political view because at the end of the day, we're solving solutions for humanity. And the UAE is no different. We're very excited about this sector, and we see it as a sustainable long-term sector for the UAE. Space is a very important sector and need to be regulated and coordinated, and this is where UAE Space Agency was established in 2014. The amount of investment that the country has spent on space activities in excess of $6 billion so far. We have more than 50 companies providing space services within UAE, and we are looking forward to develop this forward. Because we're a young country just getting into space, it's very important for us to first set the policy. We did that in 2016. In 2019, we issued National Space Strategy, as well as space law and regulations. The first objective in our law is to attract more space activities. What's also unique about our space law is that we tackled futuristic and emerging matters when it comes to space. An example, space tourism, which is currently allowed by our law. Utilization of space resources, launching from space, whether from the international space stations or from any celestial body, and try to translate that into a national regime that try to balance between two objectives, serving the commercial, but at the same time, trying to capture the safety and security requirements, protection of environment requirements, whether the environment on Earth, but also environment in space. We've also, alongside that, developed an investment promotion plan. The UAE is one of the first investors in new space through our investment in Virgin Galactic, so we understand the potential, and therefore, we've designed the space sector to cater for that. We offer tax-free environment, we offer incentives, and we hope that this will not only be the major big missions alone, but also a whole ecosystem of a space sector that includes everything from universities to research labs to companies operating right here out of the UAE. UAE just sent the first astronaut to the International Space Station. Hazza al Mansouri was sent to International Space Station to do science, and also he provided aspiration to the youth of this region. We have been, as a space agency, mandated to work uh, to try to bring you know, the Arab regions, the Arab countries, uh, together to do uh, a joint space project. The Arab Space Cooperation Group is an initiative uh, by the UAE, uh, along with 11 
Arab countries in the region. Today, the leadership of the, of the country do not want the UAE to work alone. We've managed to develop a leadership position. We're trying to work with other countries to help them establish their own space programs. We also have a project that encompasses several countries. It's called the 813 satellite. So we made sure in our design to include representation from these countries where they help design it, they help manage the project, and they help retain that knowledge within their country. It will take four years to design and build, and hopefully by end of 2023, the satellite will be launched. This project will be the first satellite having hyperspectral sensor covering the all Arabic countries. One of the aspects or important aspects is the environmental issues. Today we do have big challenges in the region, monitoring the changes, the climate change. That's why I strongly believe that this project is going to be a very good example regionally and internationally by such international collaboration. The Emirates Mars Mission program aimed to design a spacecraft called the HOPE, which will be launched in July 2020. It has a unique orbit where it allows the spacecraft to act like a weather satellite. We are trying to capture information regarding the Martian atmosphere. We have infrared spectrometers, an ultraviolet, and also a camera. The whole project is the first ever spacecraft that ever been built in the region. So we are leveraging on this program to establish a core of engineering and scientists from UAE. And this cannot be done without having a research and development arm in local universities. We were very aware that there will be a big limitation short term in terms of talent. So we decided to get in touch with the academic sector. We already have four research and development centers in space as well as three universities offering programs in space. And this is why space comes in very handy as a great tool to explain the benefits of STEM. We're delivering solutions that not only help astronauts on the ISS, but help people globally. We're seeing already, as we speak within three years, a great shift in interest in STEM. We're seeing an increase in students studying postgraduate studies. And that really tells us that we need to work a bit more and even expand that across the country. With the NSSTC, I worked on the AOCS, Altitude Orbital Control System, which helps stabilizes the CubeSat during mission. And I learned a lot from uh, all of the people I worked from and from their expertise. I'm a programming student in UAE University. I learned how to program the CubeSats using many programming languages. I'm a physics student at UAE University. I joined the satellite program, which provides me with the STEM skills required to work in space industry. As we know, space required long-term planning. We are looking forward with optimistics. We have a great cooperation with most every space agency on Earth. We learn, we engage, we network, and we try to facilitate the transfer of knowledge and technology to uh, our country. We have a mission to Mars. We have our first astronaut. We have our first 100% built satellite made in the UAE. And we're also building a science city, a Mars science city in the UAE to bring space close to everybody within the UAE. So I think it all started with a dream and today it's becoming a reality. The University of South Australia is the University of Enterprise because we work very closely with industry. We're the number one university in Australia for getting industry research. It means that we have a really good network of resources that we can lean into for helping our startups actually get where they need to be. And we can also link in with the teaching in terms of getting students into our startup companies interns. So we help the whole cycle of getting a student experience and also helping the research projects get to that next level. The Institute of Telecommunications Research has been around for approximately 30 years. We uh, do research in wireless communications, especially in satellite communications. We supported a number of missions with international partners and we developed some hardware for satellites as well as for ground stations. And we work with local startup companies as well as multinational companies. Myriad is a great example of the University of Enterprise because they're a spin-out company that came from our Institute of Telecommunications Research and they started out as a small uh, research project that turned into a startup and now they're growing and are raising money and supporting the South Australian space ecosystem. Myriad is revolutionising the Internet of Things by providing ultra-long battery life, low-cost connectivity 
that works anywhere on the planet by connecting things on the ground to tiny satellites in low Earth orbit. We've got a real passion for growing the space industry you know, beyond just Muriota. Things that we've learned around bringing a product to market and raising capital, I think um, they're things that now uh, the next generation of startups can really benefit from uh, to help them uh, do, do similar things. Lux Aerobot, uh, they're a company that have just come into our Venture Catalyst space program. They're from Canada and they already have uh, connections into our defence industry. The Venture Catalyst Space Program um, is a new program. It started in 2018 and it's supported by the South Australian Government. The whole aim of the program is to support early stage space companies to get bigger um, and get ready for investment. So we provide them with a range of supports that include a, an office space, a stipend, uh, expert advisors, workshops and mentoring. And that allows them to grow their business in a risk free environment. So Lux, we build and operate atmospheric satellites for Earth observation. So we operate high altitude balloons with the payload that's a camera and we sell the live high resolution images of the surface of the planet to natural resources companies as insights on their operations. A few months ago, we decided that we wanted to commercialize in Australia and uh, increase our operation. So we decided that uh, the University of South Australia was the best partner since it's located in Adelaide where all the action with the new space is happening. And we feel like it's the best timing ever to be here and participate in what is to come. So really exciting about that. So the Venture Catalyst Space Program actually delivers different types of help for uh, entrepreneurs. One of them is definitely getting us to meet the ecosystem really fast. Um, so that should be partners, universities, or industry and also it has enabled us to kind of reach to customers faster and therefore get to, to market a little, little quicker. ResearchSat are looking at payload systems for CubeSat so they can conduct research in um, outer space. They're very technical so what we're providing for them specifically is how to start a business and how to get that business up to a point so that when they're ready to grow they can be scalable. So ResearchSat is a company that designs payloads that are housed within nanosatellites which allow for scientific experiments to be formed in space. We run the experiments in low Earth orbit, we collect the data and we transmit them back to the researchers on the ground so that they can process them and um, carry on with their research. Essentially we just want to try and increase the accessibility to perform research in space because we believe it is crucial that we understand the space environment scientifically more so if we are to continue venturing into space. So we applied for the Venture Catalyst Space Program at the University of South Australia because as an early stage startup we, we had the technical skills to produce the product that we envisioned but we were lacking the business skills and the general knowledge of the space business startup landscape. So through one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions and numerous workshops, we were able to gain those skills. We hung out at the Venture Catalyst facility for quite some time while we were doing our modelling and raising capital. Uh, and we found that to be a, a good stepping stone, sort of leading into us starting the company. So Adelaide and South Australia is a great location for space startups. We have the Australian Space Agency headquarters based in Adelaide, as well as Mission Control. We have a long history in the defence sector, so we have a lot of people who are here already working with technologies that are really relevant for space. I think Adelaide at the moment has the right ecosystem for space companies and especially for space startups. You have a number of big players located here. You have support from universities as well as from the state government. So you actually have a particular size and a particular scale where a large number of startup companies can grow with their different ideas and that just creates the right environment to really drive innovation in Adelaide. So our vision for the future is to try and support as many new companies as possible, whether that's coming out of our University of Enterprise, UniSA, or whether that's other companies that are coming into South Australia that are part of our Venture Catalyst Space Program. We really want to see more companies get to the stage where they're investable, and if we can do that by providing them with a range of supports and expert advisors and mentoring, then we're doing our job in trying to create um, you know, a thriving economy in South Australia.
I work in the navigation and mission design branch. Uh, really, we answer two basic questions about trajectory, design, and navigation, which is where do you want your spacecraft to go and how do we track it when, it, when it's there. We support numerous mission types, everything from low Earth orbits to lunar missions to cislunar missions, which are in between Earth and Moon, to planetary and even heliocentric orbits. A lot of times we get this opportunity to really see the mission from the very beginnings of the initial idea that someone has to explore some new science, all the way out to implementation, all the way out to the operations room where we're standing here to be able to, to actually implement that mission and be able to really achieve that science and discover new things. Flight Dynamics is really exciting because every mission and every day is different. I work with low Earth science missions and that generally means missions that are in the regime from a couple hundred kilometers to about a thousand kilometers. Aqua Aura, Terra, Landsat 7, and Landsat 8 fly in a constellation, so we have to be really careful about their interactions with each other and where they are, make sure that they're not going to get too close to each other, and it's really important to get that earth science data for climate research and for current weather predictions. It's an exciting time supporting lunar science now with a renewed focus on the moon. We have low thrust CubeSat missions in development and we've been flying the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter since 2009. It's returned a treasure trove of data in the past 10 years on where the water ice is at the lunar south pole, as well as to map out the entire moon, um, finding where the hazards are for future robotic and human landing uh, locations on the surface. We've flown missions to the moon, now we've flown missions out to beyond a, a million kilometers from Earth to the Sun-Earth Libration Points. Uh, now we're going out to asteroids, we're going to Mars, and we look for even uh, further beyond that. When we get farther away from Earth, we can't rely on GPS anymore, so we use different techniques such as optical navigation, where we image celestial bodies, such as on the OSIRIS-REx mission, where we use a camera to image the asteroid Bennu to navigate the satellite. We launched in September of 2016 and arrived at the asteroid in December of 2018. And since then, we've been forming detailed characterization in a series of hyperbolic trajectories and orbits uh, to allow us to learn as much as we can about the environment of Bennu. From a navigation perspective, the OSIRIS-REx mission is one of the most challenging ever executed, mainly because Bennu's size. It's only about 500 meters in diameter, with a gravitational attraction of 16 orders of magnitude less than that of Earth. Because of this small gravitational forces, we have to take into account a lot of the perturbing forces that are typically ignored or only considered in most navigation applications. Our team has been pushing the boundaries for small body and interplanetary navigation and has set us up for a successful mission to date and in preparations for our touch and go sample collection in 2020. I was the Flight Dynamics lead for the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which is a telescope looking for exoplanets, specifically exoplanets sort of in the Goldilocks zone um, that could harbor life. The Kepler mission uh, flew for 10 years and found just over 2,000 exoplanets. Uh, TESS, since it's launched over, a little over a year ago, has found over 1,000 already. Uh, so that is very exciting and it makes us look forward to the future. The James Webb Space Telescope is a successor to the Hubble Space Telescope and it's going to be designed to explore the birthplace of stars, planets, and galaxies. What it's doing to get there to do that science is a trajectory uh, going to the uh, balancing the Sun, Earth, and Moon in what is called a Lagrange point. It's called the second Lagrange point in particular, and that's beyond the Sun-Earth line. And it, hopefully over there, it'll be able to keep the Sun behind its back while it explores the universe. My name is Sam Schreiber, and I'm the Deputy Operations Director for the Goddard Flight Dynamics Facility, or as we call it, the FDF. The Flight Dynamics Facility supports science missions, like we fly tests here. We're going to fly the James Webb Space Telescope. We have also flown the Hubble Space Telescope here. But we also support human missions such as the space station, visiting vehicles to the space station, will also be supporting missions going to the moon and hopefully beyond. It's not only the mission support, you know, the other part of the, the excitement that we have is also working with outreach programs. Uh, we have a lot of students that we work with in the NASA Student uh, Technology Research Fellowships. We do a lot of internships. We have uh, dozens of students come in over the summertime to work with us on different applications. And all those innovations are really exciting to see that we get the latest and greatest information that are being developed by the universities that gets put back into our software and hardware. We are really lucky. We're all basically working our dream jobs. 
Most of us grew up dreaming about space, and, and yeah, we're just really lucky to be able to wor work in jobs that we love. Virgin Galactic has a few surprises up their sleeves for commercial human spaceflight and going forward to the moon. Let's take a moment to hear from the CEO of Virgin Galactic. I think the destination of the moon is super exciting for the future of human spaceflight. And obviously we haven't been there for a long time. Our primary contribution is through NASA's Flight Opportunities Program, in which we fly experiment packages up to suborbital space. What's very exciting is that our uh, sister company, Virgin Orbit, is going to be able to start launching small satellites up towards lunar orbit as well, uh, using a new kick stage. And so we'll be able to uh, contribute both in the sort of prototype testing of experiments as well as actual, actually sending experiments into lunar orbit. On a personal level, obviously, we haven't actually left low Earth orbit since I've been alive, right? So I was born in 1974, uh, just after we uh, ended the Apollo program, uh, or at least the lunar part of the Apollo program. And so, you know, it's about time. We need to explore. It's part of our DNA. And so I'm, I'm excited that we're building a program that can enable us to do that. Well, I think the very exciting thing about this moment in time is that we are at the verge of a revolution in commercial spaceflight. And um, that will have manifold benefits for people on Earth. We're going to be able to fly hundreds and eventually thousands of people into space. We're going to enter in a period where almost everybody knows someone who's been to space. And I think that perspective shift where uh, you go into space and you look down on our planet and you understand the fragility of our Earth's ecosphere is going to be a tremendously powerful paradigm shift for the planet over the coming years. And at Virgin Galactic, obviously, we hope to make a major contribution to that shift. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Industry Day, where we feature the many ways that industry makes all these space visions a reality. This year, this prestigious award is being awarded to Blue Origin for distinguishing itself as a true leader in developing reusable launch systems and liquid rocket engines. And now, it is my honor to welcome on the stage to receive this award the founder of Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos. I'm actually uh, incredibly honored and uh, appreciate it very much. Thank you. This is a national team for a national priority. Uh, we could, I could not be more excited to be doing it with these partners. And this is the kind of thing, it's so ambitious. It needs to be done with partners. This is the only way to get back to the moon fast. And this time we're going back to the moon and we're not going back to the moon to visit, we're going back to the moon to stay. We hope you enjoyed our show today, but remember we'll be back each day of the Congress with much more exclusive material. We'll see you tomorrow.